She's, she's in her crib and she's sleeping and I would sit there nights and I would look at her in her crib and I would weep just because she was alive. Just because she was alive. And she started showering with me early on my shoulder. She loves water. She's a fish. Because I could, you know, I felt like, I said to Tina, I, I said, you know, I feel like out of it here. You're breastfeeding her, you know. I mean, all I get is the crappy diapers, you know. It's like, this ain't working. I need to be more involved with this child. I don't like feeling outside. I don't feel like feeling like I'm not part of it. So I began to take her in the shower with me because she hated the little tub on the sink anyway. And we began this way. <clears throat> Raising her was a ball. A ball. People talk about the terrible toes and the terrible threes and this and that. And we just looked at a little person who was creating her personality. You know, give her room to be whoever the hell she is. I watch parents in the stores all the time trying to get kids to not touch stuff. We let her touch everything that was appropriate, that wasn't breakable. You know, Tupperware in the market, yeah, who the hell cares? Pans in the market, you know, pull a bob thing of salt off the shelf. Who cares? Who cares? It's not going to break. And you know what we discovered from that? When we have her in some of the finer shops of, of pottery and things in Santa Fe, we would tell her, you can't touch anything in this store. Nothing. She was fine with it. And she didn't have to test us. Why? Because she got to touch everything else. It was OK. I had to learn that I didn't know how to have fun from this daughter. They say there are teachers. I'm going to keep this short. but. We've done a brilliant job of raising her, I can say. And in the divorce, the only thing we didn't fight over was our daughter. We had made a determination when it was apparent it was going to come that that was the one area, one area, there would be no conflict. We would only concentrate on what was best for her. And we have done that steadily for three years now. And I think she's really benefited by it. Well, she spends a lot of time with me in California. She comes out a lot. We have a good time. We have a good time. Very different for her with me than it is for her in Santa Fe. Anyway, one time I'm bathing her. She's like, whatever age is the age where um, they're still young enough that they need someone in the bathroom with them to keep them from drowning. I don't know, two, maybe less than that. I always use the shrinking hand method of determining whether it was time to get her out or not. You know, if her hand started to get smaller, it was time to get her out. I didn't have any other yardstick to use. One night, I'm hanging there by the sink in the bathroom, and she's in the tub, and she's having a good time. And she indicates this dirty, pink, stuffed kangaroo sitting next to me on the counter, and that she wants to bathe this kangaroo. My immediate reaction, I learned to count 10 with the child. My immediate reaction is this. No, 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 no. You cannot bathe the kangaroo. It is stuffed. The seams are going to come out. The sawdust is going to get wet. It's never going to dry up. It's going to smell bad. You cannot bathe the kangaroo. <laughs> I thank my dear dead departed mother for her input on kangaroo bathing. It's important to know these things. It's important to know where this stuff comes from. You know, you got I have to know where it comes from so I can do something about it. So I look at the kangaroo, look at my daughter, look at the kangaroo, look at my daughter, they what the hell cares? Right? What's the big deal? Give her the kangaroo, a bottle of Johnson's baby shampoo, within two minutes, kangaroo and child have completely disappeared from sight. Under bubbles and suds and all this. And I just keep reaching in occasionally, checking her hand, and you know, she's doing okay. <laughs> when she gets when she's ready to get out, the hands, you know, getting smaller, I get take the kangaroo, put it under the faucet, rinse it off, wring it out. Get her out of the tub, dry her, towel wrapped around her. Her and dad go down to the laundry room to throw the kangaroo in the dryer and dry it out, you know, because it's wet. 
We put it in the dryer and we punch 40 minutes or whatever we punch. And daughter and dad walk away from this laundry room with two and entirely sets, different sets of energy. My daughter is so thrilled she can't stand it. She can't wait to come back and get her kangaroo. Dad, on the other hand, knows the only way the kangaroo is coming out of the dryer is with the dust buster, right? <laughs> I was raised in a home with a lot of positive thinking. You know? <laughs> they came back 40 minutes later and this beautiful, fluffy, pink, clean kangaroo was sitting in the dryer waiting for her. I let her take a chance and do what she wanted to do and it worked out fine. And from that, I learned that I had to let her do things that were going to fail and I knew it. I had to let her build things I knew were going to fall over before she got anywhere close to where she wanted to get. I had to learn to allow her that so that she wouldn't be afraid to try things. That she would begin to understand as a child that life is an adventure and it's not about, you know, failing. It's just about trying. And if this doesn't work, you try something else. There's a reason for that. That helps create solution-oriented people. What kind of home did you grow up in? I grew up in a home that was totally focused on a problem. Nobody ever fixed the problem in my house. The first thing people in my family did and my extended family is look for somebody to blame. Whose fault is this? And as soon as they found someone to blame, that was it. Everybody was happy. <laughs> what about, you know, we had an aunt in Colorado <clears throat> who they were for years bitching because she didn't do something about somebody who was going to get an easement across her property and block her out of her driveway. But it was Aunt Sill's fault. <laughs> 20 years go by. And they're still talking about Aunt Syl and her idiotic decision not to do anything about putting us. It was great. If and my parents were having a bad day or some of the extended family, they could always feel better because no one had taken the time to help Aunt Syl deal with the easement. <laughs> That's not uncommon in families. Find somebody to blame. Often it is the children. There are things in families called triangulation. How many people here know what tri triangulation is? For those of you who know and didn't raise your hand, and those of you who didn't raise your hand, it's me telling him what I want him to tell him. Go tell your dad, would you tell your mother I'm not ready for dinner yet? You tell your mother I need the car tomorrow night. You tell your dad to stop leaving his shaving gear in a downstairs bathroom. That's the beginning of triangulation, the inability of confrontation. Do you know where that puts you in life? At the mercy of others. If I cannot confront, I have to capitulate. It's that simple. Well, since you got sober, Bob, what's been the most difficult thing in your life for you? Relationships. I'm from, I am a male child battered by a female mom. Okay? I don't care if you're beautiful and covertly angry at men. I love that. I can be in a ballroom with 5,000 people and I can find the one woman with six megatons of covert hostility towards men. <laughs> and I like this because it's basically sexual, you see? We can't communicate, we can't confront, but this anger will come out sexually under the guise of making love. We love each other, we're making love, and we have broken the kitchen table, knocked the plaster out of the walls with somebody's head, <laughs> ripped bodies up on the carpeting, dented in the hood of the car, all under the guise of tenderness. <laughs> I love you, you know? 
I'll plaster it tomorrow. We'll get you some Tylenol for the headache, you know? <laughs> so covertly angry women for years worked for me. You know, it was great. It was just like two trains coming together. Oh, I see her. You know, it's gone. <laughs> just gone. Now I can see it in their face. And that's not, it, you know, it, it, I react finally in another way. Well, then I love you. I love you. Um, stop it, Bob. Settle down. But you put an overtly angry woman in front of me who's mad and in my face and yelling or shouting or just and maybe probably justifiably so. I am immediately reduced to a three-year-old frightened little boy who was going to get badly hurt and no one is going to come help him. That's the point from where I'm communicating. So now I just get defensive. I just get defensive. Nah, you're wrong. Forget it. I don't want to talk to you about it. You know, if it hadn't been for your mother doing that to so and so, none of this would have happened. But I got to get out of it. I got to get away. Or what I did for years is I would try and pacify their anger by, you know, giving them money, giving them a credit card to go shop with. That's why I'm fucking broke today. <laughs> Guys, you do not want to give an angry woman a credit card. Trust me. No one can shop like a hostile female on the credit card of the person she's mad at. As one girl slam dunk Rodeo Drive in one afternoon with an American Express gold card. Cost me about $17,000. One afternoon. You know what I said? Because I can't deal with an angry woman. I, I didn't know you could spend that much in an afternoon. <laughs> That's my big stand-up confrontation for the day. You know. That's the best I got. <clears throat> I'm delighted to report I'm past all that. But so what I'm saying is, do you, do you see and understand the connection between how I was treated by my mother as a child and how as a grown adult male with solid native intelligence is being crippled by it as an adult? Crippled by it. Unable to have an honest, communicative, confrontational relationship. Couldn't do it, man. I wanted to. I knew it was the right way. I knew it was the best way. I knew it was the spiritual way. I knew it was better. And I couldn't do it. Because when you're yelling, I'm scared to death. Until I work all that out. So buying a new suit, buying a new car, buying anything is not going to fix this. It's not going to fix this. And I'm going to draw to me women who know that and, you know, we just match perfectly. They will hit me in every area where I am vulnerable. It's guaranteed. Guaranteed. So we okay so far? Do we need a break? Yes? No? Short break? 10, 10, 15 minutes, take a little break. Let's do that and then come back. I, I don't want to keep anybody that needs to smoke or whatever. Okay, I have been relegated to um, this mic for two reasons. The other one wasn't working that good and apparently it was rubbing against my chest hairs and it was coming out on the tape. I tell them, well, some people will find that really disgusting and others might find it interesting. I have no idea. But So you may see me hanging on to this a lot. Um, <clears throat> it doesn't really mean that I'm tense. It just I'm keeping myself from walking away. That's all. Because uh, I really like to wander, when I, when I, as you noticed, when I talk. And so I'm here with this mic, doing what I can to be cooperative. <laughs> Horrible. <clears throat>
Okay. God, I had so many things to say. I was sitting down there thinking of all these things to say, and they all just went away. This guy was telling me down here and down front, he did an inner child workshop with us about 10 years ago, and it really changed his life. I think that's the thing about all this is, um, I guess that's the point. That's worth, I should make that point. I was uh, 17 years clean and sober in a program of Alcoholics Anonymous. I was living in a penthouse apartment at the beach. I had expensive cars. I was making wheelbarrows full of money at the studio. A beautiful, gorgeous young girlfriend um, divorcing an equally beautiful, gorgeous wife. Both high maintenance. (laughs) Oh, God, help me. I had everything, man. Job on a hit show. I had it all. I had it all. And I would wake up every morning. I mean, everything I thought I needed. I wake up every morning. I, I had worked my 12-step program really good. I'd done all the things they asked me to do. I'd written tons of inventories, carried hundreds of panels into prisons, just done it all. You know, spoke when I was asked, made the coffee, moved the chairs, all that stuff. All I could think about was dying. I would wake up in the morning, and what I wanted to do was die. I didn't want to kill myself. Suicide had been removed from my list of possibilities. There's three things I will not do. I won't get loaded, I won't drink, and I will not take my life. Those are the only won'ts in, in my life. And, um, but I didn't, couldn't stop thinking about dying. And what sounded good to me was a, a, like the curb, next to the curb and some cool water running along the gutter. If I could just lay down in it and die, then everything would be okay for me. Everything would be all right. And as I had done everything I could do uh, of what was available to me, I had no idea what to do about it. So finally, <clears throat> I went to therapists, and I was not a therapist, and I was not a big supporter of therapy, not at all by any stretch of the imagination. I had fired is the term used in, in uh, NAA for getting rid of people you sponsor help. And I had fired a couple of babies because they had gone into therapy. And like any good alcoholic, I made that speech telling them what they already knew. You know, I said, well, obviously AA and I aren't enough, so you better get a new sponsor. Well, they already knew that AA and I weren't enough. They were seeing a therapist, for God's sakes. You know, (laughs) they worked that one out for themselves with no help from me. You know, they didn't need my help. So I go to see this therapist, the woman who had, who had worked with a girl I knew in the program who was the single most damaged female I had ever met. Her history was, you would not believe she would be alive, much less sober. And I'd watched immense changes in her. So I went to see this woman. And she says, tell me a little about yourself. I said, well, she said, start with your childhood. You know, tell me a little bit about yourself. I said, well, when I was 15, they threw me out of uh, Jacob Reese High School, you know, high school for bad boys in L.A. And uh, three days later, I discovered drugs and alcohol. And I, you know, drank and used and smuggled dope and got involved in some shootings for 11 years. And then, um, you know, came to AA. And I've been in AA for 17 years. She sits there for a second. And I says, you weren't born at 15. <laughs> And I said, well, I don't remember anything before 15. And she looks at me with this very weird smile. And I thought what she was, because I'm very cynical by this time. I've done everything they've told me to do. And I'm just dying here. And she had this weird smile. And I thought the smile was that, you know, when I left the office, she was going to call the Rolls Royce dealer and tell him she'd take the one with a full leather interior because she had somebody who's about to pay for it, you know, (laughs) in her office. I had no concept that her smile was saying to me, if you have the courage to stick this out, I will be here with you when you meet the man you are as opposed to the man you believe yourself to be. Most of the stuff that adult children believe about who we are is not true. We are far better than we believe ourselves to be. But all I could do my whole life was pretend to be better than I thought I was. And that's a lot of work. 
That's why the title of my first book was I Got Tired of Pretending. I just wore out, you know, trying to make you think I had it together, that I could better than, you know, I was. I didn't want you to know the truth about how frightened and how inadequate and how inferior and how insecure and how I thought, you know, people got the handbook on how to live life when they were born, but they forgot mine. Or how, like a friend of mine says, I was born behind enemy lines. You know, it's like, it was, it was like <clears throat> I didn't want you to know that. I did not want you to know that. And this woman and I went to work, and sure as hell, one day she was sitting in the room with me when I met the man that I am, as opposed to the man that I believed myself to be. And though she taught me a lot of things, and one of the things she taught me about beliefs or learned behavior, much of what I did as a result of what went on when I was a child is learned behavior. Um, an example. The best one I know is one I had all the time. You throw a ball to a little kid, back and forth, he learns to play ball. You know? So you throw it to him, he catches it. You go somewhere else to some other country where somebody's never played ball in their lives, never seen a ball in their life, and you throw it to him, and it's... And you throw it to him again, it's... Learning to catch a ball is learned behavior. That's basically what a lot of my adult problems are from my childhood, learned behavior. That's a lot of the stuff we'll get to tomorrow. The beauty of learned behavior is this. Even though it may be grinding you into the ground right now, it can be unlearned. It can all be unlearned. That's a hell of a gift. What they taught me, I can teach me new stuff. You know? Healthier stuff, humane stuff, spiritual stuff, stuff with a social conscience. Yeah. Dan and I had a... <clears throat> one of the things for many of us is that we feel powerless. We get frustrated over the conditions of the world. We get frustrated over the conditions of our government. We get frustrated over this. We get frustrated over that. But we feel absolutely powerless. So if you're like me, you'll just get idealistic about it. And nothing will happen. I'll sit home and think, all I need is for the Senate of the United States to invite me to a Senate hearing. Give, give me three hours to discuss with them why our tax dollars should follow our children and our, what the benefit would be to all of us in decades to come. When I am done, they will walk in through a closed-door hearing. They will come out having enacted legislation on everything I said, and the kids will finally be okay. Well, that's nice, and it's a good thought, and certainly I could definitely carry on a very intellectual discussion with the Senate committee on why tax dollars should follow our children, and that should be the priority of our country, and anything less than that is idiotic, whether it's economically or socially or culturally or on any other level. It's stupid to not to do it any other way. Nothing happens. What do I see a show on TV I don't really like? It really offends me. It offends me because of my religion. It offends me because of my race. It offends me because I don't know why it offends me. Oh, what are you going to do? It's a network. You know, it's ABC, for God's sakes. Well, I'd like to go to the president of ABC and sit down with him, and I'd like to tell him what I thought about this show and why it didn't work for me and why I'm upset about it and why and why and why and why. And when I got done, they would change their program, and then they'd put some decent intelligent stuff on here. It's just interesting coming out of television, right? <laughs> Nothing happens. Nothing happens. Does that mean that I'm a bad person or a weak person or an inept person or an inadequate person? No. What it means is that I don't have enough information. One thing many adult children lack is correct information. You see, if I knew that every network counts every letter they get as 1,000, I'd write a letter. It doesn't take long. It takes a stamp, toss it in the mail, and I'll feel great. I'll feel like I really, honest to God, did something. 
And they do. They count every letter they get as a thousand. They know from experience that for every one person who will sit down and write, there are 999 who feel exactly the same way that person does, and they didn't say anything. 240,000 letters got Star Trek back on the air, for God's sakes. That's nothing. For a viewing audience that requires millions to stay on the air, 240,000, multiply it by 1,000. Multiply it by 1,000 suddenly it's a huge number and now they pay attention talking we were back at some senate hearings two or three years ago on trying to get uh, treatment into the you know national kind of national health care coverage and um, one of the senate aides told me that uh, they count every letter as 50,000 50,000 you've got something you don't like your senator's doing your congressman's doing write him a letter counts 50,000. They figure for every person who writes a letter, there's 49,999 who won't. Think of the power of that. No, you just send a postcard. And what do we get from it? Feeling great. I don't feel empowered. I don't feel so hopeless. I feel like I've done something. That stuff really works for me. Really works. Now I'm not a you know maniacal letter writer sitting at home cranking out 77 letters a day to you know to 77 different agencies, bureaus, networks, politicians, and the president. You know, as Ann Quinlan said the other day when she's being interviewed, she's a very very fine writer. I have a lot of respect for her. I mean, you, you got to think of some of the downsides of this for Bill. You know, one is he'll never be able to smoke a cigar in public again as long as he lives. <laughs> I love that. She's such a bright, intelligent writer and great mom. And, you know, they just were talking to her about it. And she just said, well, you know, he's got his own stuff here. It's going to have to stop. And she's right. I think what made it so funny for me was she's absolutely right. This guy can never light a cigar again in public and probably not around his friends. If his friends would probably be worse. What would you do to your buddies? I know, I'd crucify mine. <laughs> I wouldn't want to. I want to be gentler and more humane, but I couldn't help myself. <laughs> Tastes good. <clears throat> Get yourself back on track here, Bob. You're just going south quick. <laughs> okay, learned behavior. Can you think about any that you have? What about your silverware drawers? Are they set up like mom's? Where's your kitchen? Set up like moms. Now, I want you to know the other side of all this is you can make sure that you never do anything that your parents did. And they still have as much power over you as if you're doing everything they did. So if you're not buying the kind of dishes they bought, you're putting your whole kitchen in a different order they have, and if dad bowled and you wouldn't, you know, the only thing you'd use a bowling ball for was target practice, you know, <clears throat> whatever it may be, you are not going to replicate your family. They got as much power over you as if you're living a life identical to theirs. They still control you. Because that's what you're thinking about. Them. There's some kind of a saying that comes on like greeting cards and flyers, something about, you know, for our children we need to provide them with wings and roots. Wings and roots. If you came out of a dysfunctional system, you do not the odds are, have any wings. And probably not any roots. Because to return home in difficulty as an adult is to re-experience what was put upon you as a child unless they have had some kind of help themselves. They haven't changed. No, no. My, my mother knew that I drank tab. My tab drinking for a few years in recovery was notorious. I would go to speak <clears throat> in, you know, Hidden Pines, Missouri, and they'd have a can of tab on the podium for me. I'd go to my mother's to visit. <clears throat> Never. Never. 
And I played into it. I'd show up expecting it. It wasn't there. I'd have to leave and go get it and bring it back. I must have done that 20 times. You know, I'm right there. I'll play the game. Oh, no tab. Oh, okay. To the store. You know, Mom, you know, I drink tab. You know, off to the store. Play the game. Be controlled by dear mother and her puppet strings. During the time I was eating really sensibly, I didn't eat any dairy. My mother made some dinner. I don't know what it was. She used to, now, knowing I was a vegetarian, she used to, when we used to go out for dinner, my stepdad and her and I, she'd take us, me, to the sizzler. You know, this is mom, right? She fixes this dinner for us one night, and I'm sitting there, and um, she brings out this casserole, and she says, um, this is um, some potatoes and, and cheese, and I, I, you know, with cheese melting on them. I know you don't eat dairy, but it's okay. <laughs> Lois, my then girlfriend, kicked me under the table to remind me not to to go off like I was about to go off and kill the poor woman. But I didn't understand what was going on. I wanted to forgive her. I wanted to get free. I wanted to get healthy. I wanted to get well, damn it. I wanted to cut the string. You know, I was sick of the string. And I would sit and I'd read books and work and forgive her and go to church, anybody's church, didn't care what church, and pray for forgiveness and then I could forgive her and then I'd forgive her and it would be great and I'd feel wonderful and I'd drive down to Fallbrook to visit her and she'd open the door and I'd want to strangle her like a chicken. <laughs> and I'd think, what's wrong with me? What in the world is wrong with me? Well, I hadn't forgiven her. I had, in, I had forgiven her intellectually. Intellectual forgiveness to me is not forgiveness. It doesn't work. My mother was dead when I finally forgave her. By the time I, I almost didn't write my first book because I hadn't forgiven my mother. I thought, what the hell am I going to say? I haven't forgiven her. And I thought, why don't you tell everybody you haven't forgiven her? Then you don't know how to get there. You know, put that in there. So I thought, okay, I will. <clears throat> and then one day after she was dead, I was doing something. I don't even know what. And I don't even remember where. And this thought came to me. I wonder what my mother's parents did to her to so set her up, to so beat her only child. One day she was standing in front of a house somewhere, a little girl, in a dress with hopes and dreams and they were trash just like mine and that was forgiveness at that moment I had forgave her I got it but it was not an intellectual forgiveness it was in here I had an understanding I could feel her pain whatever it was I didn't know what it was but I knew she suffered and her suffering had no meaning because she was never able to do anything about it. I am blessed today and there's a world of help available for me. So the suffering in my life will have meaning. It will change me into a better man, a better person. Constantly. When I'm willing to do it. Now get it, I just recently started therapy again. And I was talking to this psychiatrist who's sober a long time, good guy. I said, I want you to know, I don't want to do this. I really don't want to do this. I am so sick of this crap. I could just go ahead and throw up in your office. I, which he said, you may have to. <clears throat> I said, I don't want to do it. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of going down there. I'm tired of digging. But I know it's in layers. I mean, I know it's in layers. I've been experiencing this for 10 years now. It's in layers. You know, 20 years now. It's in layers. I do all this work, I get all this crap out, and hey, there I go. You know, in the park looking at the birds, looking for butterflies. Yeah, it's great. And, you know, nine months later, I'm sitting in the corner of the sofa in a room where I've been for three days and watching television. You know, I'm thinking, what? <laughs> Somebody wants to talk to me on the phone. I don't want to be inconvenienced. I'm busy. I'm sitting here watching television. Leave me alone. I think, oh, no. You know, or I'll get into something with somebody in a store or an encounter with a friend or something and off it will go. Same stuff I worked on last year. 
It's just back at a deeper level. See, the oppression is heaped on the children in levels. It's layered, like a layer cake. And I think that's God's way of protecting us. Because as I begin to work my way down, it's okay. I can get through the early layers. And the bigger ones, although they are extremely more painful, are I can get through in a tenth of the time. I can go in now with a killing, emotional, grinding, depression, just murderous, and Dr. Hefner and I, Leland and I, can get through it in a week. And I'm back out there. I like that. You know, I'm sick of nine months of crawling across the office floor crying, you know, where the only, you know, the only solution coming out of my body is snot, you know, and I've got it all over my shirt sleeves from wiping my nose on my shirt sleeves. Run into some friend after I leave my therapist's office. How you doing, Bob? Good, thanks. You? <laughs> fine. That's always been the operative word. How are you? Fine. I'm fine. Thanks. You? I'm not fine. But I don't know how to tell you I'm not fine because I believe that if you know I'm not fine, one of three things is going to happen. You're going to make me go away. You're going to go away. You're going to draw the attention of others to it and publicly embarrass me. So I can't let you see I'm not fine. It was years in the program before I started talking about the voices and that stuff. No one else was talking about listening to all these voices sober. All these people were fine. I'm getting crazier each day I'm sober. The longer I'm sober, the nuttier I am. I'm chasing, I'm meditating for four hours in the morning and then chasing somebody 100 miles an hour down Doheny Drive in Los Angeles because they failed to use their turn signal. You know. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm completely berserk. Completely berserk. Everybody else is fine. I'm thinking, I'm waking up with all these goddamn people talking to me I don't even know. One time I became solution oriented. I held a meeting at home alone by myself. I put all the chairs in a circle. Every chair I had in the house. Got out the big book of it. We were having a problem, so I decided I'd make it a discussion meeting. It's like at 3 o'clock in the morning, you know. So I give it to this guy over here in this chair, and I make him read the steps, you know. Have this guy over here read the traditions, and then I move from chair to chair as I have this discussion. And eventually, after everybody spoke, I wind up in a screaming argument with myself. You know? And then I start to laugh, and I feel better, and I go to bed. I don't have any other way to deal with it. What the hell do you do with this? Three o'clock in the morning, who am I going to call, right? If you're filled with shame, you're not going to call anybody at three o'clock in the morning. I'm not okay. Sorry I woke you up. No way. Not me. Not me. I'll have a meeting by myself and be completely berserk. But it was healing. Worked. I used to suggest it to people. You should have seen the expressions. I couldn't understand why they didn't just go, oh, yeah, great. They were like, what? What are you talking about? That was when I began to, to distinguish that everybody wasn't alike <laughs> in recovery, despite the great man's um, analogy that, you know, you, you put all the alcoholics in the bag and you shape them up, shake them up and you pull one out, you got it. <laughs> no, no, no. No, no, I finally just discovered over the years I was a lot crazier than a lot of people, but I also was having more fun. You know? The other day I was sitting home and it was really quiet and I was sitting there and I was this thought to God and I don't even know why I thought, thank you for all the lives you have given me to live so far. I think, oh, I know what it was. I'd been in a lunch um, conversation, business meeting with all people not in recovery. And they bored me sick. And their lives bored me sick. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with them. It's their lives. Maybe they're happy. I don't know. My guess would be no. 
My guess would be somewhere in the last three days before they die, they will get a look in the eye that's the most terrifying I've ever seen, and I've seen it in a few people's eyes, including my mother's, just before they die, that they missed it all. They missed it all. And so, with these people with nothing to talk about, I thought, thank you, God, for all these lives. And some of them have been tough. And somebody I loved more than anyone I've ever loved in my life, except my daughter, died from cancer four months after we got, two months after we got married, three months. You know, I've seen it all sober and clean. Forget the streets. That stuff's so far back now. It's like a joke. You know? It's like a joke. Sure, so part of that's in me. Of course it is. I remember Tina saying to somebody, we lived out where there weren't any people in New Mexico. Somebody said to her, what if somebody breaks in the house? She said, Bob will kill them <laughs> if they mean harm to me or Alexandra. And I thought, you know what? She's right. Wouldn't hesitate. Wouldn't hesitate. Of course, it's kind of ludicrous when you have two big shepherds that would eat a goddamn elephant for lunch, you know. <laughs> I never really f feared that possibility of someone reaching the house. It was kind of like, nah, you know. So part of me is still there. Some of that anger and rage and compassion, but it's also survival stuff. I will survive. I will protect my small ones. I was a living joke after Alexander was born. Tina had to have a house. I had an apartment. She had to have a house before the baby was born. She wanted a cave. She just kept saying that. I need a cave. I need a cave to bring this child home to. And, of course, we got the miracle deal, you know, of all times. We bought this wonderful little 110-year-old adobe, got it for a rock-bottom price. The woman carried back an $80,000 second for, with $250 a month payments as interest with only 1,000 principal on it every three months. I mean, it was such a deal. And it was one of those things over something that looked like a tragedy. Her pit bull had eaten the small dog next door, the alcoholic Mexican that lived there. <laughs> And he, you know, behaved like any one of us would, particularly local folks there. And it was, he was going to kill her and cut her up in little pieces and burn her in his barbecue. So she, she just thought it might be time to move, that it could be very difficult forming a good neighborship with this guy. And he was great. I loved them. We got along super. So we got in this house. And it's getting cold. I mean, she was born in February, which is winter back there. And, and it's like, like January. And... and um, we turn on all the heat, the electric baseboard heat. And the next month, I get this electric bill for like $500. And we're living on a, we're living on a fixed income. I had taken cash and put it away in a safety deposit box, and that was it, you know? Basically, we were... And, and, of course, the only thing she craved was sushi when she was pregnant. So rice and fish bring a nine-pound, nine-ounce baby girl if you want a large child. And no money once she's born. I mean, we ate sushi three, four nights a week. <laughs> so I go down to the electric company. This is what's great about New Mexico. I go down to the electric company. I say to the guy, Jesus, God, what a mighty. This has got to be a joke. You know? He's got baseboard electric heat. I said, yeah. I said, nah. That's probably right. I said, I can't install, you know, the baseboard hot water heat. I can't afford something like that. That's a lot of money, you know. He says, tell you what you do. <clears throat> Just disconnect all the electric baseboard heat. We, I told him about the house. He asked me about the house. The walls were like 16 inches thick, you know, just mud adobe walls. He says, go get a wood stove. Won't cost you much money. Burn it on high for about three days. Full blast, day and night. Once the adobe soaks the heat up, you'll be fine. And, you know, the wood won't cost you but pennies compared to this electric bill. And here's the guy working for the electric company, you know. That's the one thing I always loved about New Mexico, because they all help each other out, because they got to live too, right? So just go get a wood stove. Yeah, stop this. So I did. <clears throat> now I have a tendency occasionally, <laughs> once every ten years, to sometimes do things to excess. 
bathroom without taking off at least your shirt or your blouse or, you know, maybe your pants, man. That living room was like a sauna. I, you know, because I'm, I'm like, I'm a mountain man now, you know, I'm going out and chopping.